Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at uh, the Food 101 data set. This is a data set of images of 101 different foods. We have a whole variety of different foods. Uh, we're going to try to classify between these 101 different classes using a pre-trained MobileNet V2 model. So let's hop into the notebook. Um, we are using NumPy, Pandas, the path object from Pathlib, and OS.path for working with the data. Uh, then we'll, we will use PyPlot and Seaborn for some visualization. Train test split function, let me zoom in on this. Uh, the train test split function for pre processing. The model we'll build with TensorFlow, and then we'll analyze the model's performance with the confusion matrix and classification report from sklearn. So let's get started by getting the uh, file path to the, or the, the directory path for our image folder. So this should be the folder that's right above all the class folders. So images, I'm just going to call that image dir over here. Um, I'll paste that in. Um, and instead of leaving it as a string, I'm actually going to turn it into a path object from pathlib. This makes it uh, gives us a lot of nice functions that we can I'll have to import first. Um, some nice functionality that isn't available if we're using a string. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is create uh, a file data frame. So what this is going to do uh, is have a list, but basically a data frame containing uh, one column with all the file paths and then another column with all the labels for each image associated with file path. So uh, using this format we can use the Keras image data generator function um, flow from data frame which makes it a lot uh, very, very easy to select which, which images you want to use in your model and which you don't. So uh, this, um, there are like a thousand of each of each type of of uh, food. So we're not going to use all of the images. Uh, that would be a tremendous number of images. That's a thousand times one of one. We'd end up with a hundred and one thousand images. It would take forever to train. Um, so for the purposes of the video, we're only going to be using a subset of ten thousand images. Uh, ten thousand one hundred to be precise. We'll, we'll use a hundred images from each class. So it's about one tenth of the size, um, and yeah. So we want to sample uh, only a thousand images from each category. So we're going to create this data frame, uh, and it's going to start off by just holding all of our image file paths. So what I'll do is create. Um, well, we'll take image dir, and because it's a path object, it has this nice function glob, which allows us to use glob expressions to target files within the directory. So um, I want to look for. I'm gonna, the expression I'm going to use is star star slash star dot jpeg. Now all the images we have are J, jpegs. So what this will do is say uh, search for anything followed by star anything dot jpeg within the final directory. So this double star allows you to go through directories uh, and not worry about the, the slashes. And if we run this, it will actually return a generator object. So we're going to get a list of it uh, to get the actual file paths. So I'll call this file paths. And now this might just take a moment, uh, but once you run it once, it will be faster the next time because it, the, the file paths will be cached. So um, we'll also get some labels. And to get the labels, uh, what I'd like to do is take each, um, ob each, each file path that we get using the glob function. So we'll take file paths. And why don't we take the first value? So I'll just wait till this finishes and then I'll resume. All right, it finished. So if we look at the first file path, you'll see it's a POSIX path object. Um, and whether this is a string or a path object, it doesn't matter. We can use os.path.split. I imported os.path earlier um, to split the string or, or path object so that we get the prefix and the file uh, that comes, uh, that just the file name. Now this is useful because you'll notice that the class name is actually contained in the parent directory. So if we then split this again, os.path.split, uh, well actually what we should do, we just want this part, so I'm going to do sub zero just to get the prefix and then we'll split that. Uh, and that will split off the class name from the rest of the path. So we can then get the second item to return just the class name. And this is a function that will return the class name for each file path. So let's then apply it to all of our file paths. What we'll do is map a function 
uh, this lambda function will take in an x, which will be a given path, and it will apply this. So instead of file path sub zero, we'll just do this for a given x. Uh, and then we're going to map this function to file paths. So uh, once we have the map object, we're then going to turn it into a list, and we're going to store this in labels. So if we run this, uh, and then we take a look at labels, we should have a list of all of the file paths. All right, so now that we have two lists, one with the file paths, one with the labels, and that they're in the right order, let's turn them into se pandas series and then concatenate them into a data frame. So our file paths will now become pandas.series of file paths, and we'll give it a name, which will be file path. Then our labels will become pandas.series of labels, and we'll give it a name, which is label. Um, now, I want to turn these both into strings. Actually, uh, labels is already a string. But let's turn this one to a string because it contains path objects. And then we'll create images, which is just going to be pandas.concat, file paths, and labels, and concatenating along axis 1, which means side by side. So I run this, and I take a look at images. Uh, you can see we have a file path along with a label, uh, and these are all strings. So we have t uh, we have 101,000 images here. And like I said, we're only going to use uh, 100 of each class. But I don't just want to sample this directly, because we will end up with slightly uneven class distributions. So what I want to do instead is sample um, explicitly sample 100 from each category. So to do this, uh, we'll create a, an empty list called categories. Uh, we'll call it uh, category samples. And we'll make it an empty list. And we're going to populate this list with the samples from each category. So for each category in, and this is where we get the actual ca uh, unique values of label. So we can say images uh, sub label dot unique. So for each unique value for each class, for each category, we're going to create a category slice. And this will be a slice of our image data frame uh, containing only that class. So uh, we can we can do this. Uh, sorry, category slice equals uh, images dot query. So the query function allows us to target only certain elements of a data frame. So for example, if we do images dot query, um, and the query we pass in is is a label equals French fries, we'll then get all the examples containing a French fry label. So I want to use up here a query that says label equals, and I want a uh, category. I want it to change based on whatever, uh, whichever iteration of the loop we're in. So we can target environment variables using the at sign, like that. So when label is equal to our given category, we'll create this slice that just contains examples from that category. And then we're going to take uh, the slice and sample that slice. We'll sample 100, 100 images from that slice with a random state so that we can reproduce the results. Um, and then I want to take this and pa put this uh, sample, uh, this uh, data frame of 100 samples into our category samples. So what I'm going to do is just say category samples dot append and then pass that in. Now at the end, our category samples is a list of data frames uh, with a one, 101 different data frames, each containing a different 100 samples from a class. So we're going to concatenate them all together into image df which is going to be pandas.concat. And the list we're specifying that we want to concatenate is just category samples. And we're concatenating along axis 0 now, which means on top of each other. Uh, and once we concatenate them, I'm going to shuffle the data. So we're going to sample again with fraction equals 1.0, which means sample 100% of the data without replacement. So it's just a shuffle. Um, and we'll also include a random state so we can reproduce the results. Last thing to do is once we shuffle, uh, we're then going to just reset the index because the indices have also been shuffled. Uh, and I'm going to include drop equals true to prevent the old indices from becoming a new column. So let's run that. Uh, now let's take a look at image df. All right, so image df now contains 10,000 uh, images, which is much nicer for, uh, for our purposes. Uh, we'll have a faster training time. And you can see that we have, if we look at uh, image df sub label, dot value counts, you can get the class distribution. We have a hundred of each type of food. And you can see they've all been shuffled as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
Um, now we'll do our train test split. So we have uh, our data set, and I want to set. Uh, I want to send 70% of it to the train set, 30% to the test set. So we'll call it train df and test df, and we'll get that with the train test split function from sklearn. We just pass in our image df. Uh, we'll also specify our train size, which will be 70%. And this will give it one, another shuffle as well. And because we're shuffling, we'll include a random state. OK, so now we have our two sets of data. And we're ready to create our generators. So generators are a nice way of loading in the images uh, of one batch at a time so that we don't run out of memory. Uh, we can set the batch size maybe 32, load in 32 images, train on those images, and then recycle the memory for the next batch so that we don't run out. Uh, so let's create that. That's going to be tf.keras preprocessing dot image dot image data generator um, and so in here you can specify any preprocessing steps you want to apply to the image as well as data augmentation uh, so we're going to call this train generator um, and we're going to be using a pre-trained model today uh, we're going to use the mobile net v2 pre-trained model so uh, we have to specify our preprocessing function here Uh, and that's going to come from Keras's mobile net v2 preprocessing function. So we want to preprocess the images so that they're ready to be fed in to the pre-trained model. So our function is going to be tf.keras.applications.mobilenet underscore v2 dot preprocess inputs. Um, and then we're also going to give this a validation split of 20%. Uh, because we're going to draw the train set and the validation set using the same generator. Then we'll, we'll just copy this over, make a test generator now, and the only thing difference here is we're not going to give it a validation split. Okay. Uh, oh, I misspelled it. Forgot the E. Oh, and up here. Oh, uh, it should be input, not inputs. Okay, there we go. Now we're going to use these generators to, to uh, specify how we want to load in the data during trading. So if we take train generator, this has a function called flow from data frame. You can also use flow from directory if you don't want to go through the trouble of making all these data frames. But then your directories have to be very neat and exactly how you like them. Uh, so with flow from data frame, we're going to specify the data frame we want to flow from. And by flow from, I mean uh, the data frame sort of specifies how we're uh, like which which images we're using, and the generator then takes images through the data frame, um, trains on them, and then recycles them. So uh, we we specify train df here. Then we give it an x column. This is the column that contains the file paths to the images as strings. So that's file path. Then a y column, and this is the path for our labels. I mean the column for our labels. That's label and a target size. So um, the generator will automatically resize the image however you like. Now I don't think we need to specify this because the preprocess input function should already resize them. But I will anyway. If we're using mobile net v2, then the default uh, image size is 224 by 224. So we'll leave it like that. Specify a color mode. Uh, so we're using RGB images, so that's RGB. And then a class mode. And this is going to be categorical since it's a multi-class uh, classification task. Now we specify a batch size, uh, and this can be what we, whatever we like. We'll use 32, um, but by specifying the batch size here, we don't have to specify it later during training. We'll also shuffle the data uh, because this is the train generator. We definitely want to shuffle uh, after each uh, epoch. The seed will set as 42 so that we can reproduce the results, and we'll set a subset. So the subset is only available if you're using a validation split. Um, and it specifies, are you taking uh, the 20% validation or the 80% training? Uh, so this is the, we're going to take the 80%. And if you set the seed, then your subset will always be the same. All right, so we'll grab that and duplicate it. And now we'll create val, uh, sorry, actually, let's save this in train images. So train images is going to like hold the specification for uh, how to pull files, and this is actually the thing we pass in to uh, the fit function of our model. Now this one will be val images. 
and the only difference here is that the, val the subset is going to be validation. Alright, we'll do one last one. This will be test images, and this has a few differences. We'll be using our test generator instead, which doesn't have the validation split. Um, the data frame will be test df, and we won't need the subset or seed, and we'll turn shuffle off. So shuffle equals false. Alright, this should flow the data. It should look at all the, uh, the directories and find the images. So we have 101 classes for each. This is train, validation, and test. All right, so now we'll start modeling. And we are using the pre-trained model. That comes from tf.keras.applications.mobilenet v2. Uh, and so we specify an input shape here, which again is going to be 224 by 224 uh, by 3, 3 for the RGB color channels. And we're going to uh, make sure to include, um, I mean, include top equals false. So include top means, um, do we want to keep the uh, the uh, classification layer, the final classification, um, that the original model was trained on? So MobileNet v2 was originally trained on the ImageNet data set. So we'll actually include weights equals ImageNet. So we keep the same weights. Um, and the ImageNet data set has a thousand classes. So if we include the top, we'll have a final classification layer for a thousand classes uh, at the end. Uh, we want to put our own classification layer at the top of the model, uh, which just means the end of the model. So we're going to make sure to include top equals false. And lastly, we'll, inclu we'll include the pooling. Uh, we'll put average pooling on the end. And what this will do is just ensure that the, the output of this pre-trained model is one dimensional. So we're going to average across uh, all but one dimension so that we get a single vector as output. Uh, and that well, we could add this ourselves if we wanted, but we, this just allows us to do it on our own. All right, now let's call this pre-trained model. And we have to make sure, this is essential, that we set pre-trained model dot trainable to false. And this will ensure that we don't mess with the original ImageNet weights. So the purpose of using a pre-trained model like this is called transfer learning. Um, is this model has been built to be very good at extracting useful features from images. So this is known as a feature extractor because uh, the whole convolutional network, uh, the, the convolutional layers, the whole part of the network that isn't the, the top, which is meant for classification, is meant to extract features from the images. So we're sort of extracting two-dimensional features from the images. Bits of the image or uh, the um, Basically, like maybe you can think of them as images themselves uh, that are useful. Sorry, it's hard to this is hard to say because they're not really images. The features are two dimensional, but they're really just bits of information uh, that are useful in taking features out of the image. So let's say you have uh, a curve in the image. You have this feature that can target, that can identify a curve. Um, and because this, this original model was trained on such a vast, uh, large variety of images in the ImageNet data set, um, it's very good at extracting those features. So what this outputs is essentially nice features uh, that, we, that have been extracted from any image. And we take off the top so that we could then use those features to classify for our purposes. All right, so let's run that. And then we will set up our part of the model. So our inputs to the model is going to be a pre-trained model dot input. So we just take the input right from the model. Then we'll pass the output of the pre-trained model through two dense layers as we normally would. So that's tf.keras.layers.dense. We'll give it 128 neurons, uh, a ReLU activation, and pass in inputs. And then we'll just copy this over and pass an X. Now actually we're not passing inputs, we're going to pass pre-trained model dot output. So uh, here the, is the input of the model and then it runs through the whole pre-trained model and then pre-trained model dot output gets fed into our classification layer. Or these are our two dense layers and then a final classification layer which is uh, what stores the actual probability values for each class. That will be a tf dot keras dot layers dot dense and this is the number of classes we have, which is 101. The activation here is softmax. 
uh, since we're we want <clears throat> 101 different probability values that all sum to 1. And the highest probability will be the classification. We pass in x here and then create the model, the tf.keras.model, pass in inputs and outputs. Okay, so let's uh, just print out a summary of the model. Uh, so here, uh, it's quite a big model. But you can see um, the only part of the model that we created was this right here. All the rest was part was coming from the pre-trained model. And you'll notice um, that we have all these parameters, weights, about 2.5 million weights, but only 193,000 of them are trainable. And those are the 193,000 that come from these three layers. All the rest are not trainable uh, because we set them to trainable equals false. All right, so now we'll start training. And I want to be sure to uh, turn on GPU acceleration for this, uh, since we're doing image classification. Uh, so let's turn on GPU. Um, and we're going to first compile the model. So we're going to use an atom optimizer. For our loss function, uh, this will be categorical cross entropy. Uh, so the reason we don't use sparse categorical cross entropy is because when we use image data generators, uh, it encodes the classes as vectors. Um, so instead of just passing in integers for each class, it actually gives a one-hot vector for the class. And when you pass it in in vector form, you should use categorical cross-entropy. When you pass it in as integer form, you should use sparse categorical cross-entropy. All right, our metrics here will be accuracy, since it's multi-class. Our history will be model.fit. And here we pass in our train images to train on, some validation data, which will come from val images, uh, the number of epochs. We don't have to specify the batch size here since we did it earlier. We're going to train for a bunch of epochs, so 100, and then use the early stopping callback function uh, to stop whenever the validation loss stops improving. So that's tf.harris.callbacks.early stopping. We're going to monitor the validation loss and set a patience value. Uh, I'll do three. And so when the validation loss stops improving for three consecutive epochs, we'll stop the training and restore uh, the weights from the best epoch. So restore best, my S key, okay. <laughs> restore best weights equals true. All right, so I will train this model and resume when we're done. All right, so the model has completed training uh, and we'll get some results. So let's get the results uh, from model.evaluate, which will give us a loss and accuracy for the test set. We pass in test images. I'm going to turn off verbose mode so that we don't get the loading bar. Then we're going to print out test accuracy. I'll display it to two decimal places as a percentage. Format that with results sub 1, which will give you the accuracy value. I'm also going to multiply it by 100 since we're using, uh, we're doing uh, a percentage. All right. So while that evaluates, let's create some predictions, which will come from model.predict on the test images. Um, so these predictions will actually be 101 probability values for each test image. Um, so we want to get the classifications uh, by the highest probability value in the predict set of predictions. But we don't just want the highest probability value, we want the index of the highest probability value. Uh, we can see we have an accuracy of 41%. So given that we have 101 classes, that's not terrible. Uh, we do want to see a confusion matrix to get a better sense of how we're doing, though. Um, so right. Uh, so model.predict will give us back uh, probability values. So we want to get the index of the highest probability value. Now we could do numpy.max just to return the highest probability in the set. Uh, and we could do it across axis 1 to get the highest probability for each test image. But we can do argmax to get back the index of the highest probability, and that will be precisely what we're looking for. So we'll get the predictions by taking the argmax of model.predict. Then we'll create a confusion matrix, which I'll call CM. 
and that comes from the confusion matrix function from sklearn. We just have to pass in the actual labels and the predicted labels. So the actual labels come from test images dot labels, and the predictions are the predicted labels. Then we'll also do a classification report. This also comes from sklearn, just gives us a few more statistics about the confusion matrix. And I'll call this one CLR. Then the target names. Um, I want to know the actual like text labels associated instead of just integers. So we're going to specify the target names here. Actually, it might already come. Yeah, I think I think we don't have to actually. Actually, uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. Okay, so I'll run this, uh, and then I want to plot the confusion matrix. So we're going to create a new pie plot figure. And we're going to give it a big figure size since we have 101 classes, so 30 by 30 should be good. We'll create a seaborne heat map to plot. And the heat map will uh, will pass. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Um, we'll pass in the confusion matrix. Turn off annotations. No, turn on annota annotations. Uh, format with a G like this so that we see it as uh, integers and not scientific notation. Set the minimum value to zero, give it a color map of blues, turn off the color bar. Then we'll give it some tick marks. So we'll do the X ticks. And the X ticks, um, first we have to specify the spacing of the ticks. And that will use a NumPy A range, will just be um, evenly separated integers and from 0 to 101. And we'll shift them over by 0.5 so that the tick marks lie in the middle of each box. Then the labels will be given by test images dot class indices. So if we if we look at what that is, um, this is actually just uh, a mapping between the integers and the uh, and the uh, name. So if we if we specify this, it'll just use the keys of the dictionary as the labels. All right. So we'll do exactly the same thing for the y ticks, and I actually I want to rotate these. Um, so that they don't overlap, we want to give a rotation of 90 degrees for the y x ticks and 0 degrees for the y ticks. All right, then we'll plot the x label. Uh, so I mean, the, this is the axis labels. We'll predict, I'll say predicted on the x, and we'll have actual on the y. Then we'll give it a title, which will be confusion matrix, and show. So let me just verify that we don't need to. Okay, hold on. We actually do. Okay, so um, let me print this. This is the classification report, and you see we do have integer names. So I'm going to go use these up here by specifying the target names as the class indices. All right. So I, I want to print this out with a, a nice little title there. So just put that in like that. All right. So let's load this up and see what we get. All right, so we can see the confusion matrix. Um, and I'd say it's pretty good. Uh, so we really don't have too many um, misclassifications. All right, well, you see we our F1 scores with a, for a given class are not fantastic. We can see certain classes are having really good scores. Like Edamame has a 0.99. And that's probably because there's no other class that looks like Edamame. Uh, some of them are not doing so well, uh, but overall it looks, you can see that nice diagonal. It means we're getting a pretty good performance across the board. Uh, so let's look at some of these with a few misclassifications. For example, there's, an, there's eight misclassifications here. That means there was actually lobster bisque, but we, uh, we predicted it as clam chowder. Uh, and that is understandable because if we look at lobster bisque and we look at clam chowder, they're actually quite similar, just the color is different. Um, so we could look at some more uh, over here. Uh, we have ricotta and oh no risotto and fried calamari. Uh, maybe that one's not as much, but I could see it. And then over here we have eight as well. So let's look. That is chocolate cake, and it's being misclassified as tiramisu, which is understandable as well. Um, but overall, you can see we have that nice uh, diagonal. So we are doing. Uh, okay. 
And yeah, the classification report just reflects the performance in each class. Precision is saying out of all the predicted values for a class, how many did we get right? And recall is saying out of all the actual values for a class, how many did we get right? The F1 score is a combination of the two. All right, and that will sum up today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.